Greetings. Today, one of my TRS-80 Model 1s got taken out of storage, dusted off, because I wanted to do something with it. I thought long and hard, not really that long, but, you know, I wasn't going to write programs for it. So what's left? Built some hardware for it. The TRS-80 uh, this channel has done several videos on TRS-80s and you can search for them by clicking on the channel name and then on the videos tab and you'll find some references to TRS-80s there. Uh, this machine is, uh, well not this specific one, but this type of machine is dear to me because this was my first PC and uh, it it taught me a lot, so I always try to keep at least one working one around. For those of you familiar with this machine, you can see it's a minimal configuration. This is actually has level 2 ROMs and 16K and a keypad. The model 1's, uh, uh, I mean the level 1's usually had 4K of memory and level 1 basic which was more of a tiny basic than anything else. Level 2 is a little bit more powerful but just as slow as level 1. However this, you can see this is a minimal system, it's only the computer and the monitor and the reason for that is developing hardware I always try to use a minimal system I mean, otherwise, a full system would have the expansion interface, which is an, gives you extra memory, floppy disk controller, other goodies that sits underneath the monitor. And then, of course, you have one or more floppy drives. But again, when developing hardware, I don't really want to have to go through rebooting this thing tens or hundreds of times while developing and risking develop. Uh, uh, damaging some of the extra hardware. So we're going to use a minimal system or I use the minimal system for developing the hardware. One of the problems with using a minimal system for development is that uh, is a program storage. I mean I wrote the software in basic, it just goes quickly, it's interpreted, no big deal, but uh, Here's the problem. The cassette recorders, they just never worked right. I kept the heads clean on them. I would come up with volume settings on them and put hot glue or tape on the uh, volume control. But it would work for a day or two and then on the third day without altering anything I would try to load programs that I had saved before and they wouldn't load anymore. And I'd had to go through all of that again, adjusting volume, using different tapes, and so that kind of put made it made me think twice before going to a minimal system. But there is a better solution, and the obvious solution is to use a digital recorder. Now, nowadays, uh, most people would use a phone, but uh, I've had this guy for a while. I've used him on many different uh, micros for cassette storage and uh, I hooked it up, it took very little time to get it working. So before introducing the hardware project we're actually gonna jump ahead and just load the code and uh, hopefully it'll prove my point that it's totally reliable, I haven't touched the volume settings, I haven't done anything on it. So let's see uh, if it's going to betray me or actually load the code that I've saved on it. Okay, let's see if she still wakes up. She does. And we're ready to go. So basically we use the cload command which stands for cassette load and it sits there and waits for data to come in then we press play on the recorder 
wait for a little while and we will see the little flashing asterisks which as long as they're flashing means they're loading and then when it says ready it means it loaded the whole thing and didn't give us an error message and believe me I stared at this pair of asterisks a lot years ago whenever trying to load something because that was your indicator of whether it was actually loading stuff or not and it would most of the time blink a couple of times and then get stuck. It would never come to the ready prompt meaning that it had an error when loading off of the cassette but as you can see it loaded the first time not a very big program but yeah having to type that in every time you turn it on would put a big dent in the development effort but there it is so let's turn our attention now to the actual hardware so here's what I came up with a simple interface to an LCD display how many TRS-80s have you seen uh, with an LCD display what is it good for you got a screen well actually it makes quite a nifty debugging tool because it's like a second monitor and you could put debug messages on here and you could actually use bigger LCDs this is a uh, 16 character by 2 line but you could put uh, you could put the 20 character by 4 lines on there really long ones, uh, big ones, whatever as long as it's like Hitachi uh, 47 uh, what is it, 47800 uh, compatible whatever the uh, main uh, driver chip was they used in all the early displays and this one is it has a parallel interface and uh, so all we need to do is write parallel data to it now also on an LCD you can take the dumb approach because these these LCDs are actually pretty slow so what you could do is after writing a command wait a default of I don't know six or seven milliseconds because that would give it enough time to process the command and then write your next command next character or whatever that is really inefficient so this also implements the ability to read the busy flag on this thing and the busy flag so you send a command to it or before you send a command to it you pull the busy flag on it uh, and the minute the busy flag becomes inactive low that means it, it's ready to accept a new command these two chips are the uh, are a fully bi-directional 8-bit uh, parallel port that the uh, TRS-80 can talk to not a whole lot here as you can see there's a PLD here specifically a GAL 20V10 which is which is erasable can emulate any TTL or CMOS chip it works in both uh, I mean both combinatorial and sequential the difference being without getting into it very deeply sequential devices have a clock input and need a clock signal whereas combinatorial in combinatorial it acts on the inputs at any instant in time taking propagation delays into account of course this is just now when I said you can do your own TTL or CMOS devices well I said it can do any of those existing ones but you basically use them to make your own and combine all sorts of functions into it for this app I really only needed a combinatorial thing that decoded the port it uses a Z80 port and uh, the read write signals that are for a port called an IO write in a Z80 and generates the proper output signals and it needs this uh, the LCD needs a few more signals it has a register select and uh, it has it has a register select the read write and also an enable input which is really something that uh, the Motorola the 6800 or the 68000 series 
provide that is that is like the master clock for this thing to latch commands or send out data the Z80 does not have an equivalent so you kinda have to generate your own enable signal here so that all of the data flows properly on the LCD. The only other thing that isn't technically necessary but I put it on for future expansion is a bidirectional 8-bit buffer data buffer. The data lines run through this and it you basically switch them back, switch the direction of the chip back and forth depending on whether the processor is reading or writing to this. The reason I say you don't really need it is we're only the TRS-80 manual cautions you and says that the fan out of all the signals coming provided on this interface the fan out's one meaning you can drive one TTL load maximum with any of, of, of the lines coming in here. That's not really true. I did look at the uh, at the interface and uh, it can drive more than one load but hey we do things by the rules here and if I decided to put something else on here you know I was going to do a blinking LED but you know it's kind of a comparison how long does it take to blink an LED on an Arduino versus blinking an LED on a TRS-80 but uh, that that didn't seem like something very rewarding so I so I jumped the queue and came up with the LCD so now the software the hardware is set up we gotta go in and load the driver program again let's see I have to make sure to load the correct file I think this is it, yes. So it's going to load for a second time in a row. I think, I hope, yes it is. See the little indicator. And after that super fast load, is it all there? Looks like it. So really it asks you for what you want to display. So line one, the top line. Oh, got to fix the prompt. Okay, so now if I hit enter, it will transmit all that data to the LCD, so let's switch our view to the LCD. And here it is, and I'm hitting the enter key now. And there you go. You saw that it wasn't very fast, even though I am checking the busy flag on it, but the, the fault of that is level 2 basic is interpreted and it, it really runs pretty slow. But as you can see now I have an um, invaluable debugging tool for the TRS-80 and we can start hooking up a bunch of other things to it. This was written in assembly language. It, it would run a lot faster but it would take a lot of time and it would probably be very impractical to develop assembly language uh, on a minimal system as I'm using right now because not only do you have to save your source code but every time the machine crashed because you did something bad on the board you plugged into it you would have to reload the assembler program off of you know the same way it will work reliably with the digital recorder but it'll take a few minutes to load the assembler every time so that is that is not practical but you know so you can stand here for five minutes and put in put in other messages and enjoy them yay as I mentioned, this will work with pretty much any LCD that adheres to the original uh, timing. The signals are the same, and, and but the timing is very different. So what you're looking at here, I mean, this one is 
the one I used previously, it's uh, it's very slow and it follows the data books from 30 years ago to the T. Now there's some that look better, which I personally prefer prefer greatly, and that's the vacuum fluorescent display, which is also compatible with the old ones, but it's actually a lot faster. It's probably faster by a factor of four, three or four, as compared to the old ones. So when you use these, your timing is always kind of on the edge if you don't have special hardware. If you Basically, this is an extension of the CPU bus with the decoding, and we're at the mercy of the signals generated there. And I found, found a couple of these, actually, of which I had a lot. This is a cheapo made in overseas display, and most of them work, but some of them don't really work, and I think it's a timing issue. But uh, this one, I always use this to test initial builds with an LCD because it always seems to work. Now, I highly recommend these because they are very, very readable. That may not properly show up on the video, but they are, you can read them from any angle. They don't have a contrast adjustment, which I have up here for, for, the, for other LCDs, but because this is a VFD and it's very easily readable. So let's put something on this one. The digital camera isn't going to do it justice, but uh, it looks really nice, I mean, but you pay the price for it. They are significantly more expensive. I think, you know, one of the cheapos here you can get for four dollars or five dollars backlit LED with backlit LED the list price on these is closer to seventy dollars whenever they had a sale on these things I would buy one for like forty dollars or so but using those on a uh, commercial product you better have a real deluxe product to put this thing in but uh, yeah let's see let it let it talk to you see how well it comes up you can kind of see I mean any angle you can see this uh, on uh, LCDs you know the angle adjustment is crucial because if you actually move your point of view the letters start getting e uh, the, the display starts getting either really really dark or light there's no such problem with this. It's, you can look at it from any direction. And I mean, you've seen these kind of displays on old style cash registers and stuff like that. But if you pick up one of these cheap, you know, I would go ahead and do it. Uh, Futaba and uh, Samsung are the major players still making these. I'm sure there's others too, but uh, they also make graphic displays, which are equally equally gorgeous as this one but the prices are above a hundred dollars for something this size that doesn't give you great resolution so again for home experimentation sure buy one but if you're designing anything for resale financially you need to think twice well thank you for watching Please like and subscribe, and uh, we'll see you soon.